Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about the Rum Hospital, uh, a little bit in passing about Lachlan Macquarie, and, uh, and a little bit about Francis Greenway. But as I think Francis Greenway had a sort of a bit part in the story of the Rum Hospital, I don't want to give him too much, t too much air time. So just introducing um, some principal characters, obviously Lachlan Macquarie, governor of, fifth governor of New South Wales from 1810 to 1821. And on the right of that picture, a self-portrait of Francis Greenway, who um, came to uh, Sydney as a convict, transported, but was then subsequently acting civil architect from 1816 to 1822. And his fortunes were very much tied to Lachlan Macquarie's big building program. And perhaps uh, a, a, a less well-known character, but of interest in what I want to talk about with the Rum Hospital is Lieutenant John Watts, who was Macquarie's aide-de-camp who was also a military architect and uh, designed you know, quite a few buildings in Sydney, although it's not clear whether he was responsible for the Rum Hospital or not. Macquarie arrived in Sydney on the 28th of December, 1809, just before New Year, and I think he was sworn in as governor either on the 1st of January or 2nd of January. And within only a few weeks, his very first dispatch back to Lord Castle Ray, which was in um, April and which he wrote uh, at the end of February, he spoke uh, about the urgent need for the construction of a new general hospital, noting that the current building was in an uh, unfit state for um, reception of the sick. In the same um, dispatch, he also mentioned the need to build a new military hospital. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a military hospital and the general hospital were being constructed at roughly the same time. Military hospital, much, uh, much less grand building than the general hospital was finished earlier. So here's the, I'm going to dive into the architecture a little bit um, and you just need, need to bear with me for a, a moment because I think there's some interesting threads to draw together. Here's the first uh, drawing we know of the proposed hospital, uh, dated 1811, which is a drawing that was sent to England for approval. And it shows generally the form of the buildings that were eventually built, but a, a really interesting feature is that there's a break line between the main roof and the verandas, and the verandas are, are uh, as an addition to the main roof. And that's actually not how the building eventually was, was built. Here's a much later drawing. It's got a, a stamp from the Government Architect's Office of 1854, but it actually shows um, the hospital complex as it was uh, eventually built. So a really long... Um, central range, which was basically in the form of uh, a military barracks, a, a series of dormitory spaces with these long verandas and these um, shorter supporting wings at either end. And the wings at either end were originally the residential quarters of the uh, colonial surgeon and the assistant colonial surgeons. So if you imagine the, um, the mint building that we have now, which has uh, four rooms on the ground floor and four rooms on the upper floor, they started out as two very spacious private apartments for um, assistant surgeons. And here's a, a slight, another uh, 1854 plan which is quite interesting because it shows on the plan on the right hand side shows the upper floor of this building, the south wing, subdivided and rooms created for, uh, you know, sub subdivided for different uses to the original use. These plans also all, sh all show the original configuration of the building with the verandas going all the way around all four sides. So they started out as these big uh, open-sided pavilions with um, double-height verandas which shaded the building but also captured breezes. And the building itself was sit situated on this high ridge line. And um, just to confuse you, here is a, a view which is in your program and it's actually the military hospital located at Flagstaff Hill and the, the, the building itself survives inside what's now the National Trust Centre, so it's been encased in a much later building. And uh, on the lower right is a, a plan reputedly by Watts of the military hospital. And if I just jump back one, one image, you can see that there's a very strong similarity in the plan form of both those buildings and the use of the double height colonnade and particularly the way the roof stretches right out over the veranda without the, the brake line. Here's a, an image that we've used quite a lot. It's a um, very popular 18, 1820s, a series of watercolours done by a military officer which were later published as a set of uh, lithographs in England. In, in a way, it's a slightly idealised view of um, Sydney uh, in the post-Macquarie period. I think it was published in 1825. 
But this one's really interesting because it shows the military hospital in the foreground. So I think the view's taken from probably from Fort Phillip or Flagstaff Hill. And it's looking east back across the town. And you can see on the horizon in the background the three blocks of the of the uh, General Hospital along Macquarie Street. Now, in deciding to locate the new hospital in Macquarie Street, which uh, the, site, the site had previously been part of the governor's private landscape domain, and uh, Macquarie created Macquarie Street and made this first uh, gesture, I suppose, of building a public building on a new alignment, and which set in train the process of subsequent buildings in the city along Macquarie Street. So we've ended up with this government and administrative compound situated on the east side of the city. And that's a, a marked departure of Macquarie's from the previous governors, whose centre of administration was at Government House and the military administration around um, Church Hill and what's, what's now <coughs> Wynyard Square. So uh, I see that as Macquarie making a quite deliberate decision, uh, which was uh, followed by subsequent governors of trying to separate military administration from the civic administration and Macquarie starting off that process of establishing all the sort of um, civil uh, processes and systems like, like the civil courts, uh, a public hospital rather than a military hospital and set in train the process of these buildings along this end of Macquarie Street and uh, westwards down King Street. I've got a few early views, I'll just flip through them fairly quickly, but they, these date from the 1820s through to the 1840s and they show how visually dominant the hospital was in Sydney right well into the, 20, well into the 19th, mid 19th century. This is a view from um, what's, what's now Potts Point, but Woolloomooloo Hill, looking across Woolloomooloo Bay to the back of um, the uh, domain. The domain is still covered in eucalyptus trees and the hospital buildings very dominant on the ridgeline. And in the far right, uh, you can just see Bloor's new government house sitting down on the lower um, slope uh, overlooking Benlong Point. So this, I think this is from 1838. And here's another view from uh, Dawes Point Battery looking east across um, Sydney Cove with the uh, windmills on Windmill Hill and the hospital really dominating the ridgeline behind. And another view I think from the 1840s from the unformed Hyde Park, which was then a racetrack, looking uh, northwards towards the barracks and um, the Rum Hospital with this encircling veranda still visually very dominant. And here's a, a slightly uh, later version still which has um, Greenway's major contributions along, along this new King Street axis. So the barracks, the church, um, the courthouse and school etc and Hyde Park starting to form um, the, the form that we recognise it now. But the hospital still quite dominant uh, in the back. Now Greenway, during the construction of the, um, the General Hospital, it became clear that the contractors had cut corners. They had used some uh, inferior materials in, in various areas. And um, Greenway also criticised the quality of the design, which we'll come to a little bit later. But uh, Greenway prevailed on Macquarie to um, carry out a, commission of a committee of inquiry. Greenway was the chair of the committee and he criticised uh, did a sort of fairly extensive analysis of the building and criticised the construction and the materials. And in particularly in relation to the south block, the things he noticed were that the, um, the basement wall that supports the colonnade was only 18 inches thick of sandstone and he thought it should be a minimum of two feet thick sandstone because it had two foot um, wide column bases sitting on top of it. So he thought it was uh, structurally inferior. He criticised the contractors for not using continuous lengths of timber because they'd, they'd, um, they'd managed to cut costs by using short lengths of timber which they flitched together. Not an uncommon building practice but uh, they'd said they weren't able to secure timbers that were 64 feet long and Greenway said well that, that's absolute nonsense, I could get them easily. And uh, so there was a need for these timber tie beams which hadn't been adequately um, addressed in the building. And he, uh, Greenway also felt that the roof construction was weak and so he introduced these additional collar ties and um, purlins and purlin struts which um, and this is his lovely longhand report, which is very self-serving. I, mean, I think you can read it uh, online on our website and, and uh, uh, in the original. It's, of course, there's a lot of uh, important structural information, but it's, it's sort of reflecting the glory of the architect as well. Yeah. <laughs> it probably doesn't come as a surprise to you that Greenway was quite opinionated. 
and uh, and he was very much a self promoter, and he had this. He was able to have this fantastic relationship, um, this sort of you know patronage with Macquarie for a number of years. This is a, a photograph in the roof of the um, of the mint, which shows one of Greenway's introduced uh, pearl and struts that supported the roof. The quote um, on the right is actually Greenway's criticism of the colonnade and the columns of the colonnade, which he said reflected as little credit upon the judgment of the colony as they did upon the profound knowledge of the architect, obviously ridiculing the architect. And so I want to just rescue the reputation of that architect for a minute. Um, here's, here's the colonnade. And, um, on the lower left are some details of the column bases and on the right hand side if you look at the top of the first floor you can see the column capitals. Now these are clearly unlike anything in classical architecture. So something went wrong during the construction of the building which is either the, the contractor, the, the stonemason may not have had moulds to work from or may not have been familiar with any of the mm. classical forms. Uh, and when the Public Works Department um, restored the mint in the 1980s, they very, very carefully copied the mistaken capitals and bases so that they're absolutely authentically wrong. <laughs> um, now, I'm just, I just want to surmise for a moment that, that what was intended was for the columns to be executed in the Tuscan order, which was a, a, a classical order invented in Renaissance Italy. And it, it was subsequently used a lot in Sydney, so particularly on houses but also on other public buildings from the 1820s on. Now, the, the Rum Hospital was the first time uh, any sort of classical detailing of any pretension had been tried in, uh, in a, a public building, and so it was a quite important precedent. But subsequently, uh, classical orders were used in a much more relaxed and informed way. So these are various examples dating from the 1820s onwards. And I think the Tuscan order was popular in use here because it's relatively easy to turn in timber. So you can put a timber piece of timber on a lathe and you can turn the details quite easily. And I think it's relatively easy for a stonemason to work in stone as compared to, say, more complex orders like Ionic or Corinthian. Um, now, it's a slight segue into classical architecture for a second, which we'll come back to the mint. Um, in classical architecture, there's a, a really um, beautifully worked out system of proportion, harmonious proportions and dimensioning which um, goes throughout the entire building such as this uh, Greek temple and it's related, uh, it's a sort of modular system of design and the module is based on the diameter of the column at the base where it touches the ground. And so the spacing of columns and the height of columns and the, the depth of the entablature and the height of the building itself are all multiples of that column diameter dimension. So in this very famous temple at a fire, uh, temple of a fire, the spacing of the columns is two times their diameter and their height is 13 times their diameter and the entablature is three times the diameter of the column. So all the dimensions are related. And this particular temple was um, studied in the late 18th century by Stuart and Rivette and published in Antiquities of Athens. So it was a, uh, an example that was really well known in the English speaking world. And um, Another sort of related bit of architecture history, I guess the, the most well-known textbook on uh, classical architecture at the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century was Sir William Chambers' Treatise on Civil Architecture. And Chambers was a very prominent architect and he basically sort of summarised the status of knowledge about um, classical architecture of the, of the antique world but also of the Italian Renaissance. And um, this is the page from the treatise on the Tuscan order. And so he shows a typical detail of columns and base which of course, don't resemble the ones at the Mint. Uh, and he also shows a system of proportioning for colonnades and loggias and the system of propor proportioning for spacing of columns. And so he says the ideal proportions for a, a Tuscan column are that the height is seven times the diameter. And what do you know? The columns at the Mint are seven times higher than the diameter of the base. And he says that the spacing between them can range from six modules, that's six times the diameter of the column, to seven modules. And we'll come back to that in a moment in at the Mint. So here's um, South Wing of the Rum Hospital. Later on today, you're all going to go out and stand at the front and look at this and go, oh, of course. Um, the columns, as I said, are, they're 18 inches diameter at the base and 14 inches diameter at the top. And that coincides exactly with uh, William Chambers' uh, description of how to narrow uh, a column in the Tuscan order. Chambers says the Tuscan order is really only suitable for rustic buildings and particularly prisons, prisons, wharfs, 
farm buildings and maybe barracks, uh, and he doesn't mention hospitals. The um, column spacing is quite interesting because the centre four bays of this building, the columns are spaced six modules apart and they're seven modules high. And at either end, the outer four bays, the columns are spaced seven modules apart and seven modules high. Now, if you stand, I mean, I've been looking at this building for five years and it only dawned on me a few months ago with this very subtle visual um, distinction, which to me contributes to the aesthetic appreciation of the building, that um, that, that difference in the spacing of the columns is, very, is almost imperceptible until someone points it out to you and then you can't imagine how you never saw it before. Related to that is the positioning of the windows on the facade behind the columns. So the windows are all positioned at the centre line of each bay between the columns, except of course at the end because the column spacing is wider and so the windows can't line up on the centre line. But the, the offset is so imperceptible that again you don't notice it until you go and stand in front of the last window and realise that it's almost uh, two feet out of alignment of where you expect it to be. But I think that that system of proportions and um, harmonious design is so effectively worked out here, it's impossible to believe that whoever the architect was was not actually quite competent and you know, quite aware of uh, classical precedence and standard practice in English architecture at the time. Um, if we were looking for precedence, there are obviously some interesting English ones, and this is, uh, this is uh, West, West Wickham Park uh, in Buckinghamshire, built in the 1740s for Sir Francis Dashwood, who was an antiquarian. He was one of the founding members of Society of Dilettanti. It was published extensively. It has a Tuscan order on the ground floor and uh, a sort of uh, elaborate Corinthian order on the upper floor. And there are lots of examples of uh, double height colonnades in English architecture. But I think there's actually a much more interesting uh, point of origin for um, Australian buildings, and it's reflected in houses as well as in public buildings. Bear in mind that um, early Sydney was a military society and it was, it was administered by military officers who'd been stationed in other parts of the world, particularly in India and the United States and the West Indies. And um, I've got a few images of buildings in Jamaica, in uh, Kingston, Jamaica. So here's a street which is called King Street and um, it, next to it is a street called Harbour Street, so quite like Sydney. There's a building on the left which might be uh, similar to a building designed by Greenway, so a sort of standard English form, if you like, and uh, colonnaded shops on the, on the right-hand side. And the, this is a view from 1825, so a little bit later than what we're talking about. Here's um, a hospital in um, Kingston, Jamaica, built in 1817, um, to which to my eye, looks virtually identical to the Rum Hospital. Uh, it originally had a pedimented central block, which has been demolished. Uh, has this uh, dormitory-like uh, barrack-style um, construction and encircling of verandas on both sides. It was designed by a military engineer in England and built in Jamaica. The columns here are cast iron, which were uh, fabricated in England and shipped out to Jamaica. But for me, the 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 form is so similar, I, 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 I strongly feel that there's a link back to military architecture and patterns of military design that were repeated by the British in different settlements wherever they went. And here's a slightly later example, also in Kingston, and uh, unfortunately a very bad image. It's actually a military barracks built in the early 1820s, so, but of a very similar form, two-storey high, single room deep with encircling colonnades, double height colonnades, um, obviously done for the climate control and um, sun control. And here's um, the centre block of the Rum Hospital in 1870, just to flip back. Unfortunately, they're reversed, but I think there's a very strong similarity in form. And um, I'm going to finish here, but it's just to, to sow in your mind the seed of an idea that we'll talk about later today, which is that the hospital function didn't continue on this site for that long. By uh, 1850, 1854, it had ended. And this site then went through a number of other periods of use and the buildings were able to be adapted and reused a number of times, including right up to the, the present day. And so there's, a, I think, the start of a really interesting discussion, particularly around colonial buildings, but also later 19th century buildings, about the question of whether they do have a, a future life and whether, whether heritage has a future. And this site is actually a really perfect example of that um, process in play uh, right at the moment. And I think that's a, a good moment for me to hand over to Fiona Starr. Thank you.